and I will call on, Rev, on Reverend Pajemi of Dios International Missionary Church in Ontario, California for the declaration. Over to you, sir. Lord, we thank you for all the wonderful, glorious children of God that have gathered all over the world to celebrate this June the 16th, where thousands of youths decided to take their faith in their hands. Lord, we ask that you speak to all the people that are gathered, encourage and empower us in all spheres of life. Father, your word says in Ecclesiastes 3.11 that you have put the quest for eternity in the heart of men. We ask, oh God, that that quest to move forward in freedom and liberty with justice for all, you encourage, you empower us. Fathers and mothers that have fought the battles, their efforts will not be wasted. We ask, oh God, that you touch all the speakers today. We ask, oh God, that this event return new successes and victory for all and sundry. More so, empower our youths all over the world, wherever the black faces are seen, let there be knowledge, wisdom, and empowerment. We thank you because you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, thank you, Reverend, for, for the prayer. Now let's listen to the national anthem of South Africa. <laughs> speaker is none other than the founder of Your Black Matters, Pastor and Dr. Francesca Fajimi. In addition to her ministry work, Dr. Fajimi has over 30 years of corporate experience in major organizations such as Nestle, Siemens, and Johnson & Johnson. She is the CEO of MFE Corp and the leading strategies partner, partnering with organization strategically and tactically. Dr. Fajimi has a doctorate in business administration with a focus on international business. Her master's degree was in the same field of business with a bachelor's in accountancy. She conducts seminars on thought provoking topics in business around the world she is specially coveted for seminars in financial excellence. She has managed teams across all continent industry, in industries such as manufacturing, food, health, aerospace, 3PL, entertainment, mm -hmm. and similar line sectors. Dr. Fajimi is passionate about empowering others for excellence and has traveled to over 60 countries for business and mission outreaches. 
She founded and hosted international academic excellence programs in Los Angeles, where academicians and C-level practitioners offered mentoring to high school students. In partnership with various global foundations, she provides mentorship to entrepreneurs. She is a board member of Open Doors USA and advisor to Open Doors International and various organizations with the focus of mitigating marginalization of disenfranchised group. Dr. Fajimi founded Your Black Matters, YBM, an organization with a single mission of providing solution to the global issues faced by the black race. She is the host of Reimagining Black Relations, a podcast of solutions to issues relating to the black race. She speaks globally about black race relations and through the YBM Leadership Institute offers coaching to black professionals and workshops to organizations with equity focused mission for black stakeholders. She is the author of Black Mystery, a book about black groups dynamics and their perception of white people. Please join me to welcome Pastor Dr. Francesca Fajimi. All right, praise the Lord, I will say. <laughs> Good to see everybody. I'm so happy to be here today and joining you all in this great celebration, especially across the globe. It is just amazing. I wanna thank God. Thank you all my friends and my colleagues that are able to join today. Some of you, I even told you at the last minute and you're here. I mean, I am so, so grateful. Um, you know, I, I truly thank God for being part of this year's event. The most exciting aspect for me is knowing that many of you are joining us from your churches, from your schools, and from many parts of the world, even outside South Africa. I heard a lot of people introducing themselves from Nigeria. It, it really is amazing. And this is my dream, bringing us all together as one body. It is amazing. It's playing out. This is exactly how I would love to see it. With all that, I feel very comfortable speaking to you from my heart. So this is not going to be a formal, but a very informal and real conversation, real engagement. You probably all know from my introduction that I am a mother of three, a grandmother of one, a wife of one, and the one is a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I am also a Christian as well. If you haven't heard about your Black Matters, you can check the website, as our moderator said, yourblackmatters.com, to get to know the organization. The foundation of your Black Matters was based on a spiritual calling. In, in fact, it was in 2020 at the onset of the global COVID pandemic. You will remember George Floyd, the man that was murdered in the US, and the video went viral. And it led to protests all over the world. When I say it was a calling, the mandate I received was to be an instrument to provide solution to the issues faced by the black race. I'm not talking about just the 40 million black people that lives here in the United States, but I'm talking about the 2 billion black people all over the world. Since then, I've held global conferences on black matters. I invite guests onto the podcast, Reimagining Black Relation, where the guests recommend various solutions which organizations and people are using today to solve problems. I coach black professionals on how to excel in their professions. And I established the Youth Leadership Institute within YBM to train black youths on leadership skills. As we start in this event today, one of the things that's actually crossing my mind is that even though we have people from different places joining us on this occasion, our youth face similar experiences, whether you are in Jamaica, Soweto, New York, London, or Limpopo, it's exactly the same. Which means that if you patiently listen and engage at this event, you will get some tools for the great jumpstart. We all need the great jumpstart. My first appreciation and gratitude is to my Lord for everything. Without him, I am absolutely nothing. I also wanna acknowledge Morongwa in South Africa, I don't know whether she's able to join right now. 
But I really want it on record because this lady went above and beyond to bring this to life. I want you to please join me to applaud her in South Africa over there. She did a phenomenal job with her husband. And I will tell you, we, we were in South Africa in the month of March. And uh, during that time, we, we absolutely had a very fruitful mission. In fact, it was second to none in my mind. We were in Johannesburg, Limpopo. I know um, Munewa and his team, they are in Limpopo right now. Why don't you guys wave? I want to see you, the Limpopo guys. All right. <laughs> All right. I was there. We were there uh, in the month of March and Zanin, Peter Marysburg, uh, Durban, Cape Town, and many other places that just escaped my mind now. Anyhow, I met Moronwa through her husband, Jerry. Moronwa is a very, very sweet lady. We spent an afternoon together in the company of other brothers and sisters, but since I returned to the US, she stayed connected with me. So out of the blue, I think it must've been around the middle of May, she suggested having a special program for the upcoming Youth Day in South Africa. The rest was history. So I wanna thank her and the lovely husband who's always working behind the scenes to support her. I also wanna thank my families, my friends, my colleagues, my mentees from many parts of the world and all the subscribers to Your Black Matters and Reimagining Black Relations for coming on to support the South African youth today. It means a lot to me. And you know what's so amazing? I have never met a king before, but guess what? We have a king here today, a king joining in. I mean, it is amazing. I'm hoping the moderator will give him the opportunity to say one or two things uh, to just uh, let us know what, what does a king look like and what do they do? I mean, how does the life of a king evolve on a daily basis? It will be amazing. Anyway, I know that uh, you heard the moderator uh, telling us a little bit about the event that occurred in uh, Soweto on June 16, 70, 1976. Uh, the Black South African high school students from various schools in Soweto, they protested in the streets because a decree was passed which forced all Black schools to use both Africans and English to teach in local schools. For those of you from outside South Africa, African is the language spoken mainly by white South Africans. So the protest was because they passed a law that African should be used to teach students in the schools in addition to English. You can just imagine it to mean that you speak English, your natural language is English, but all of a sudden they now told you that they're going to use French to teach you math, social studies, chemistry, and all the subjects. The first problem is, you don't speak French. You don't understand French. The second problem is you will never understand chemistry or math or biology or whatever it is if they continue to teach you in French. This was already a guaranteed failure for the people, the black people that are forced to do this. It was a failure from the beginning. Obviously the decree was resented deeply by the black population the Archbishop Desmond Tutu called it the language of the oppressors. Many teachers organizations also objected. The, the students began the march only to find out that police had barricaded the road along their intended route. The leader of the group told the crowd not to provoke the police and they rerouted the march. They, uh, they ended up near Orlando High School the crowd of between 3,000 and 10,000 students made their way towards the school. So the students, they sang and waved placards with slogans displaying down with Africans. Another slogan says, if we must do Africans, Vuster must do Zulu. Vuster was the prime minister and he was white. The police said they are vicious dogs on the students and shot indiscriminately at them. Many young lives were lost. Emergency clinics were swamped with injured children. The police requested that the hospitals provide a list of all victims with bullet wounds so that they can prosecute them for rioting. The hospital administrator passed the request to the doctors, but the doctors refused to create the list. Many white South Africans were also outraged by the government's actions. The day after the massacre, about 400 white students from the University of Witwatersrand marched through Johannesburg city in protest of the killing of children. 
Black workers went on strike and joined them as the campaign progressed. Riots also broke out in the black townships of other cities in Africa. In remembrance of this event, June 16 is now a public holiday in South Africa and they call it Youth Day. You know what actually made this event quite unique is that believe it or not, it sort of coincided with Juneteenth, a federal holiday in the United States commemorating the liberation of enslaved blacks. President Joe Biden signed the legislation last year on June 17, 2021, making June 19th a federal holiday in the United States. So this is a memorable day. It's a memorable occasion. It is worthy of celebration. Now, if you think back, you will know that there has been many changes since the event in Soweto took place. In fact, I think the theme that we're using today, the great jumpstart is more than appropriate. Why did I say that? Firstly, we must be thankful because the difficulties and problems faced by youth that time was definitely worse than what you are facing today as youth. At least now you have rights. You can move from one district to the other. That time you dare not. You cannot move from one area to the other. You need a permit or you need somebody that's going to give you the assurance they will accompany you. So rarely do people move from one place to the other. It's almost like you living in, for those of you that are on this side of the world in Los Angeles, and they telling you that, uh, Miss Jackie, you cannot go beyond St. Charles. That's it. To go to Crenshaw and uh, Venice, you need a permit. If you don't have a permit, you may be persecuted and we don't know what that can lead to. That was the restriction and some of the constraints and difficulties that many of our black youth, black people period, that they were facing during that time. So right now I must say, hey, we are grateful. At least you're able to move from one place to the other. However, black youth all over the world are still not where they need to be. There is high unemployment. For those of you with employment, you are probably underemployed. Many don't even have the right skills for better jobs, which leads to the cycle of poverty. There are other issues that are self-inflicting like bullying. Actually, the statistics of bullying in South Africa is quite staggering. And today we have a great lineup of speakers who will address these topics. We're gonna to be talking about bullying. We're gonna speak about building generational wealth. And we're gonna be speaking on bridging skills gap through volunteerism. The great jumpstart is breaking down walls and barriers to success. But before you can break down walls and barriers, you need to know yourself, or at least know what your community and the world around you think of you. Trying to give you the definition that the Encyclopedia Britannica captured for Negro. Okay, this was in 1798. It was a name given to a variety of the human species who are entirely black and are found in the torrid zone, especially in that part of Africa, which lies within the tropics. In the completion of Negroes, we meet with various shades, but they likewise differ far from other men in all features of their face. They have round cheeks, they have high cheekbones, a forehead somewhat elevated, a short, broad, flat nose, thick lips, small ears, ugliness, and irregularity of shape characterize their external appearance. The Negro women have their loins greatly depressed and very large buttocks, which give the back the shape of a saddle. Now I'm gonna paraphrase the remainder. These unhappy rays have the following characteristics. They are idle, that is they are lazy. You can't trust them. They are revengeful, they are cruel, they, are, they still, they are liars, full of profanity, excessive indulgence in sensual pleasures. They are unpleasant and they have no self-control. They lack compassion and they are an awful example of the corruption of man when left to himself. This is how black people, this is how they were defined. This was the description relating to black people. Now, when you think about that, this is how every human being is now wired and controlled to respect other races, but disrespect and dishonor black people. Do you know the reason why you see a black person and a white person? You always assume the white person is the boss, right? This was the reason. When you think about it for one second, you may notice, or at least I hope you know, 
that a lot of black people want to have lighter skin and they bleach their skin. Do you know why? It was because of this definition of black. Do you also know why we don't patronize each other? We don't trade with one another. We'd rather buy from um, you know, the other people than buy from ourselves. Do you know why? Because of this mindset. We have the mindset that blacks steal, blacks are liars, blacks are lazy, blacks are ugly, blacks are all these things that you've read about. To the extent that we, black people, we don't like black. In fact, you will, I'm sure you've heard about the crab in a barrel mindset. So when you take 10 crabs, for example, and I figured out the, the word for crab in, um, in Zulu is udoti. Udoti is crab. So when you think about the crab in a barrel mentality, take 10 crabs and put them in a bucket, okay? And all of them are trying to get out because maybe there's hot water or something in the bucket. As one crawls up, the others pull it down until eventually they all died. Now, why did they die? They did not die because they did not try to get up. They died from exhaustion, from trying to go up, getting pulled down. The one trying to go up was exhausted trying to go up. The one that is pulling others down died because of exhaustion trying to pull others down. So literally they all died, not because they did not have the knowledge or the way out to be able to get up, but because they have decided that, look, instead of me allowing my brother to make it, I'd rather pull us all down and we all die in the process. Now, there was a famous orator, Malcolm, who said, who taught you to hate yourselves and love those who hate you? If you don't like your skin color or yourself, tell me, why should anyone like you or your skin color? The way you see yourself, is how you'll carry yourself. If you see defeat, then defeat it is. If you see victorious, welcome victor. The battle is invisible and you can win when you apply the appropriate tactics. This must not be you, that you are going to be pulling others down. This better not be you, that you're gonna see your brother and your sister as liars and thieves. This should not be you. And this is no longer you. I'm telling you, without us overcoming that and loving one another and seeing the best in one another, I'm sorry, it is a difficult battle to fight. Do you know that the richest person in history was a black man that looked just like you? His name was Mansa Musa. He was the emperor of the former Mali empire which was a region that covered many countries in Africa. His wealth was actually determined incalculable. He only lived for 57 years. He was considered the richest man of all times. He owned the Bambuk gold mines, which account for more than 50% of the world's supply of gold. Its territory produced half of the world's gold stock. Do you also know that Frederick Jones was a man who looked just like your father and your husband, and your brother, he was a self-taught engineer with a number of important inventions. Self-taught means he did not receive formal education. His most notable invention was the refrigeration machine, which they used to transport food, blood, and medicine during World War II. Do you know that Garrett Morgan was another man who looked like you? Morgan was the inventor of something many utilize every day, the traffic light. He created this after witnessing so many accidents on busy urban intersections. In addition to this, he created the gas mask, which grew in popularity when it was used to aid workers after an underground explosion. Dr. Patricia Bath was a black woman who was passionate about helping others, which was why she became a doctor. She was the first black resident in ophthalmology at New York University, where she completed her training in the early 70s. She noticed that many of the patients in Harlem, predominantly black neighborhood, we where still, she worked, we were combat. either blind, but she noticed that in white neighborhood, she saw far fewer visually impaired, impaired patients. She conducted a study that led her to conclude that many black people did not have the same access to eye care. Her study led to better community and public health initiatives that made eye care more accessible for everyone. She went on to invent a device that drastically improved the procedure for removing cataracts. 
When asked about what obstacles she faced in her career, she said sexism, racism, and relative poverty. Now, did you hear that? Sexism, racism, and relative poverty. Those were the obstacles she faced as a young girl growing up in Harlem. She said there were no women physicians she knew of and surgery was a male dominated profession. Now, why did I share these examples with you? This is to remind you that you have role models all over the world that must prompt you to go for a big jump start. You absolutely must reject handouts. They were designed to keep you down. I know there are a lot of people that absolutely need support, the elderly, the sick, the physically challenged, and many others. But for you, you, you are vibrant, abled, intellectually curious, designed by the creator with a purpose. You need to know that if you live on handouts, there's a high probability you will remain on handouts. You are destined for bigger, greater, and better outcomes. Welfare or handout doesn't support the modern household. It creates a pattern of dependence. It does not address the real cause of poverty. Harvard University's research asserts that it might actually increase poverty because it can lower your motivation to work. In 2020, 350 rands monthly welfare stipend was introduced to provide support for the poor and most vulnerable in South Africa. For non-South Africans here today, 350 rands is equivalent to $22 per month. So the government pays this amount to provide support for the poor and most vulnerable. It sounds great because when something or someone provides support, it means whoever is providing that support really cares for you. Well, I want you to step back briefly. I read an article printed a few months ago that the number of welfare recipients in South Africa now exceeds the number of taxpayers. That is, the poor and most vulnerable are the largest population group, which confirms the point that welfare does not improve the situation. Instead of the 350 rands per month, why not engage in little trading, petty trading, be creative, provide needed services, gardening, braiding hair, cleaning, be creative, but don't be greedy. No single person can do everything, but everyone can do something. I've seen young people making lemonades, freshly squeezed juices, fruits, and many other things. Just make sure it's nothing illegal and ensure it will not negatively affect the health and well-being of the people. I must also tell you that you need to curb your appetite to buy, buy, and buy. Research shows that Black people are the largest consumers in the world. We buy things, clothes, shoes of different colors, jewelry. In fact, our counterparts that make things, they price them for us, not for themselves. They know you can spend 300 rands on something that only costs three rands to make, and they know you will never try to make it, but you will pay any amount for it. We buy, we consume, we pay. We don't make enough. We are always buying. When you buy, money leaves your hand. But when you make things, or if you sell things, money comes into your hands. So think carefully before you buy that next item. Do you need it? Or do you, or must you have it? Or it's just that, I want to have it. I would just like to have it. The other thing I would like to bring to your attention is that we must make every effort to support each other, buy and sell to one another so the money can circulate in your community. Go to your local store and look around. Tell me how many of the items are Black made anywhere in the world. The story is the same, even in Black countries. In fact, you prefer imported items because they look better. You actually believe they are better. They're better quality. They smell good. They smell, they have a broad smell. I know many of you know what I'm talking about. But what I'm saying is this, you need to promote your cultural identities. Produce, 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 buy black. All parents, black or white, they buy white dolls for their kids. Why don't you make black dolls? Make pretty black dolls for all parents to buy for their kids. It is very important because we are made in different shapes, different colors, and we can promote our color. I must also tell you this. In fact, I would be very sad if I don't talk about the impact of too much social media. 
Social media formulates, confirms, and grounds our beliefs. They make our beliefs. They tell you what is pretty. They tell you what is ugly. They tell you what is nasty, what you must stay away from. Then they tell you what is nice, what is smart, and what you should prefer. Be careful of what you watch. You know, a research I read about in the US confirmed that black people watch far more television than any other group, only 44 hours a week during the period of survey. Not only do we watch too much TV, we watch anything, whether it's good or bad for us, we just enjoy watching things. The shows may demean us, we watch it in the spirit of comedy and we laugh about it. You do realize that you have a lot of power over what goes inside you. From the abundance of your heart, the mouth speaks. You become what you feed yourself with. When junk goes in, it makes more junk inside and junk comes out. So in terms of social media, we need to control our appetite of what we take inside. I will tell you though, South Africa is not near the top, but all youth between the ages of 16 to 24 spend the most time on social media globally. I'm going to give you something that's going to surprise you. Maybe it won't surprise you. Nigerian youth are number one in the world. Nigerian youth may find this funny or feel a sense of pride and purpose and accomplishment. It's exactly the reaction you're supposed to exhibit. However, the reaction I expect from you is a deeper reflection. When I spend this much time of my life on social media, what does that mean to me? What does that make of me? How does that define me? Mayo Clinic, a major research institute in the United States, confirms some impact of too much social media. It says it includes disorder of every kind, general addiction, low self-esteem, mental ill health, suicide risk, depression and anxiety, bullying, cyberbullying. Again, it's all about what we feed ourselves with, dissatisfaction and discontentment with life. I would tell you, Instead of social media and all that hours and hours of television, use that time to learn a new skill. Read books. I know we don't like to read, but it expands our creativity and we gain more knowledge when we do this. You know, today I was told that many of you that are joining from South Africa, you're joining from your schools and your churches. And as you're calling today, I heard that most of you are Christians. And I want to say one of those phrases that I learned when I was in South Africa, they say, America Kulu. I think America Kulu means I can't hear you say amen or something like that. I just love it. The way I remember it, it sounds like America. So I just say America Kulu. That's it. So learn it is a good one to use. Now, for all of you that are outside South Africa, I want you to go along with me and you will be blessed today because I know that when it comes to the subject of religion, many people hold their heart. They hold their thoughts. They're like, oh my gosh, maybe we shouldn't touch it. I just want you to just hold that thought for one second and go with me as I try to clarify a little bit of confusion among Christian youth or those of you that are considering to be one or you still sitting on the, on, the, on the fence. Now, the first thing I want you to know is that God is spirit. He's not white. He's not black. He's not brown. He's spirit. Also, there was the notion that God cursed black people. So they would never ever make anything. In fact, they will forever serve others. But when you go back and I read, I was able to infer from this scripture, in fact, in Genesis chapter nine, verse 25, Noah was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. One of his sons, Ham, saw his nakedness. When Noah awoke, he cursed Ham's son, Canaan, that he would be servant to his brothers. It was believed that Ham was the father of all blacks. As such, blacks were cursed. Firstly, God did not curse Canaan. Secondly, we don't know if Canaan was black or white or brown. And thirdly, no one can curse who God did not curse. So let's even assume he was black. Let's assume he was cursed by his drunken father. But we know that no one can curse who God has not cursed. So it is impossible for us to say black people were cursed. Noah cursed. God did not. Now, you will also remember 
that God sent the, the children of Israel into slavery in Egypt for 430 years. Yes, he did that. He did it for a purpose. But he brought them out himself, not because they deserved it, but because he chose in his infinite mercy to deliver his people. So even if God says you've done something wrong and you're going to be punished for it, he is also merciful and he can bring about deliverance. So one thing I want to leave with you, a couple of things to be honest with you. Firstly, you need to understand that Christianity is not the religion of certain groups of people. It is the victorious path provided for all humans who receives and accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their savior. It is for all race, all creed, all religion, all whatever you call yourself, it is for everyone. Secondly, you must know that the first missionaries arrived in Africa in 1490. In fact, the Bible referenced the Ethiopian Enoch, Ethiopian, African, it was referenced in the Bible. This was around the second or the third century. In fact, the oldest church in Africa is in Ethiopia and it was built in the fourth century and it still stands. So this confirmed to me that Christianity had been in Africa before the arrival of the missionaries in 1490. So it's not anyone's religion. It is not something that somebody gave to us. And I don't want anything to feel uncomfortable saying that, why are you going with the white people's religion? No, it is not. It is the way of life given to all people who receives Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. While on that subject, though, I have to tell you everything. There is indeed a slave Bible. Look, the Negro Bible. And <laughs> this is amazing. I'm going to read just, just very few things I want to read to you from here. And I want you to just go with me. The Slave Bible was published in 1807. It was commissioned on behalf of the Society for the Conversion of Negro Slaves in England. The Bible was to be used by missionaries and slave owners to teach slaves about the Christian faith and to evangelize slaves. The Bible was used to teach some slaves to read, but the goal first and foremost was to tend to the spiritual needs of the slaves in the way the missionaries and slave owners saw fit. The names of the editors are never mentioned, although their intentions were clear, to limit and control the biblical narrative. The missionaries had to minister to the slaves while attempting to appease the slave owners in the British West Indies. The owners feared an uprising. Their usual paranoia was heightened because Haitian slaves had overcome their masters three years earlier in the only slave revolt in history, in which slaves successfully overthrew their European oppressors and formed a new nation. Slaves and free people of color, led by a former slave and the first black general of the French army, Toussaint Louverture, along with the man who would become his successor, Jean-Jacques Desalines, defeated Napoleon Bonaparte's forces, overcoming their masters. There was an uneasy tension as the slave owners sought to maintain control and keep the slaves working calmly and the abolitionists began to question the moral cost of slavery. The abolitionist movement was growing and for the first time, the souls of the slaves were being considered. As they prepared to compile a special Bible for slaves in the West Indies, the missionaries agreed to uplift the Africans without teaching them anything that could incite rebellion. The Holy Bible is a library of sacred books containing stories of trials and tribulations, courage and hope, battles and victory. The book tells stories of slavery, struggle, redemption and freedom. Whether we are enslaved by our own sin or the cruelty of our fellow men, and whether we are set free by the grace of God or through the bloody savages and ravages of war, the Bible tells the story of our downfall, our enslavement, our battles, our escapes, our victories, and the glorious grace of freedom. Throughout history, the Bible has encouraged us to fight against our enslavement, to sin, to hell, death, and the grave. But it has also encouraged us to fight against our fellow man who might choose to take our freedom and use us as 
and use us for his own purpose. Just as Egypt enslaved the Jews and used them for labor to build their empire, so were the slaves of Africa used to build the empire for the British West Indies and the United States. Just as Moses stood against the Egyptians and led the children of Israel out of slavery and bondage, so are we encouraged to stand up against the cruel bonds of slavery and fight for our freedom and the freedom of fellow man. The clarion call for human freedom is found in many forms and in various stories throughout the Bible. But all of these ideals were stripped from and carved out of the slave Bible. In the British West Indies at the time of slavery, a number of Christians sought to convert slaves from African paganism to Christianity. Some of the Christian slave, uh, slave owners wish to introduce their slaves to the Bible. However, to do so would be to introduce them to the concepts of hope, encouragement, and the struggle for personal freedom found within the book. In a misguided attempt to save the souls of the people they deemed savages while preventing their exposure to messages of struggle, hope, and freedom found within the Bible, a group of white Christian missionaries and slave owners parsed the Bible itself, cutting out and removing all chapters and verses that may have led the slaves to consider the concept of resistance, escape, and freedom. Under the guidance of Anglican Bishop of London, Bill by Podius, founder of the Society for the Conversion of Negro Slaves, the Bible was edited down to a simple and understandable volume, devoid of any verse that could inspire insurrection. In addition, the bishop's orders were to prepare a short form of public prayers for them, together with select portions of scripture, particularly those which relate to the duties of slaves towards their masters. British clergy, missionaries, and slave owners in the British West Indies found themselves in the position of deciding what parts of the Bible slaves would be allowed to read. They had to choose which parts would be needed to teach salvation of the soul and obedience to the master, while leaving aside all other chapter and verses. An example of a verse deleted is Galatians chapter 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. An example of a verse left in the slave Bible is Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters. In their attempt to eliminate all verses that could plant the seed of rebellion in the minds of the slaves, about 90% of the Old Testament and 50% of the New Testament was deleted. In the standard Protestant Bible, there are 1,189 chapters, but the Bible given to the slaves contains only 232 chapters. Absent from that Bible were all of the Psalms, which express hopes for God's delivery from oppression and the entire book of Revelation. In the slave Bible, the book of Exodus excludes the story of the rescue of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, which is the story that gives the biblical book its title. But the Bible includes Exodus chapter 19 and 20, where God appeared on Mount Sinai and gives his law, the Ten Commandments. The slave Bible left intact Joseph's enslavement in Egypt. It provided an example of someone who could accept his lot in life and work to the best of his abilities within those circumstances and was rewarded for his efforts. The resulting abridged version of the Bible is titled Select Part of the Holy Bible Selected for the Use of the Negro Slaves in the British West Indian Islands, a London publishing house first published the Slave Bible in 1807 on behalf of Purchase Society. Now, this Slave Bible, let me tell you the books that were completely eliminated. Leviticus, Numbers, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 2 Samuel, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Psalms, Song of Solomon, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, Mark, Colossians, 2 Thessalonians, Philemon, 2 Peter, 2 John, 3 John, 
June, and Revelation. I want to thank God for the slave masters who introduced parts of the book of life to the slaves. Indeed, the slaves could have forgotten about their faith if they had one when they arrived here in the new land. Remember, they were stripped of their identities, their family names, history, cultures, languages, traditions, everything. So if any of the slaves had a great grandfather that taught the children about Christianity, they could have been stripped of all that too. So thank God for the slave masters who introduced or reintroduced parts of the faith to them. Now, the scripture says in Revelation 22, 18, 19, listen to this. I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city which are written in this book. The whole of Revelation was taken out. You heard what the scripture says, I leave that. So the point here today, youth, is that I know many of you have wrestled with your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't need to doubt anymore. God is not white, God is not black, God is not brown, he is spirit. He is also not looking for people of certain colors or, or race to worship him. Rather, he's looking, he expects you to worship him in spirit and in truth. So don't be troubled by the issues that some Christians contributed to. Be rooted in your faith and you will not be shaken. And if you don't have a faith yet, I encourage you to embrace it. It is not anybody's religion. And so to have a great jump starter, you need a mindset change, a major shift mentally. You had to reject mediocrity. You had to reject the status quo. And you need to watch out for one another. That is, be your brother and sister's keeper. No one will help you except you. The society may see you as a reject, but that is only for a short while. Your generations might be poor. That is about to come to an end. You must arise. I know you have been hard pressed on every side, but you are not crushed. You are perplexed, but not in despair. Yes, you are persecuted, but not forsaken. And you've been struck down, but you are not destroyed. Yes, the color of your skin poses some difficulties for you, but it does not define you. Jabez was born in pain and the mother named him a child of sorrow. When he was of age and realized his destiny was pain and sorrow, he had two options to continue in pain and sorrow or find an alternative. He decided for the alternative. The rest was history. My goal and desire for you today is to choose that alternative and don't take the status quo as your way of life. And what I wanna leave with you today is this, the message you're hearing today, the hope you're receiving today, the effort that you're hearing and the support you're getting today, I want you to take that. I want you to meditate on it and I want you to transfer it, disseminate it, cascade it, take it to the uttermost part of the world and your life will never be the same. I will see you next year and I know you will look much better than you are today. Happy Youth Day to you all. May the Lord bless you, your family and your race. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Fajimi. Wow, wow, what a talk. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for an encouragement and for uplifting our message to all of us. And uh, we are so grateful that our jumpstart today uh, has been met with so much uh, encouragement. We thank you, uh, Dr. Van Lola. And uh, we have learned so much on, the, uh, on your talk, especially that we must, as young people, even as old people, we must find ourselves role models that our situation may dictate differently, but when we find ourselves role models, we might, we might be in the right direction. Thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for that. And thank you for a uh, word of encouragement that any uh, 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 creativity in our lives may change our destiny when we become creative and imaginative in our own spaces we can change our situation. Thank you for, for that. And I'd like also, I know that maybe we probably, many of us may have questions already. 
from the talk that we just received from uh, Dr. Van Lola. Please, if you have questions, please utilize the Q&A to post the questions on the chat box where we have a chat. Uh, just put your question there if you have a question so that at least I will do every effort to address those questions. Or if you have any concern as well, just put it there so we will also um, engage in that. Our next speaker is Ms. Jackie DuPont Walker. She is the founding president of the World Economic Development Corporation in Los Angeles. Ms. DuPont Walker oversees the construction, remodeling and management of over 400 housing projects in Los Angeles. She also serves as the chairperson of the Baldwin Hill Conservancy. And she is involved in multiple community work effort with an, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, AME, and the World AME Church in Los Angeles. Her motivation is knowing why God has placed her in this space at this time, but the prospect of making a difference motivates her to stay the course. Not only is she is every sign that she's doing what she's supposed to do a great motivator, but it inspires her when times are tough and especially when there is need for good policy and protection of our treasured legacies. Ms. DuPont Walker is one of the most influential people in the city of Los Angeles. It's a privilege to have her with us today. She will be speaking to us about volunteerism and skills gap. Thank you for joining us, Ms. Walker. Thank you uh, to our moderator. Good morning and good afternoon. Uh, let me start by acknowledging uh, the First Nation in the place where I am the American Indians who never ceded ownership of their land for the opportunity to be here from my motherland and to be in solidarity with my sisters and brothers from my native land. Let me acknowledge that I hope I bring to this land the commitment to freedom, the joy of being a soldier in the Christian army and take away the ills that have been brought here by others. Let me acknowledge that I stand in solidarity today with those who sought their freedom in South Africa, the youth, because the scripture says a child will lead us, who stood up and that I pledge today to stand with you because it is our watch it is our time. Good morning and good afternoon again. I am so happy to be invited to join you today. I didn't really understand the celebration when Dr. Fenshimi invited me. So I did my homework. And as she has said, there's so much solidarity uh, in what we're celebrating today, National Youth Day in South Africa and Juneteenth, which we finally have as a national holiday in the United States of America. The quest for freedom rests with us. The achievement of freedom rests in our listening to God. And so I wanna take advantage of the day to just talk a moment about my walk, inspired by that wonderful message uh, that we had a few moments ago, and to challenge each of us because we both are looking to a season and a common date and we can have a common journey. I think I'm going to be able to share. Let's see. Can you see? Yes. Okay, thank you. I want to talk about volunteering, remembering National Youth Day and using the theme, The Great Jump Start. A little exercise as we start, and it's designed primarily for the young people, but I think we can all learn. The choices that we can make about how we answer our call that God has given us. 
our call because we realize, and there's a saying that we have used in many different ways, while we're here on earth, service is the rent we pay by living, by being, by answering what God has called us to be. And I don't know whether you've pondered lately what your calling is. I pondered that some 35 years ago as I um, ultimately became the president of World Economic Development Corporation. But it wasn't just an exercise then. It's an exercise I go through every day. And I'm challenging you at this moment to go through that exercise with me. When we think about what we are called to do, we can sometimes gain insight by looking at symbols. So with one choice, you can gain insight into the mindset of how you look at the world and how you tolerate it. I'm going to suggest four shapes and each of you begin to look at those four shapes. And at the end, we're going to give some definition to those shapes. And we hope as we go through the remainder of our conversation, you will use those shapes to really begin to understand and ask God what God is calling you to do in your life by volunteering. The first shape is a square, and there it is. The second shape is a triangle, and there it is. The third shape is a circle, and there it is. And I couldn't quite draw the squiggly line, so draw it in your mind's eye, the squiggly line. Think now, which one of these appeals to you? Don't worry about why it appeals to you. Just think now, which one appeals to you? The square, the triangle, the circle, or the squiggly line? Take a moment. Pick a shape that best matches your personality. And I'm going to ask one or two people to unmute and tell me why a certain shape appeals to you. And then we'll quickly go through for all of us what the shapes might mean. Could I get one person to unmute and do that? Triangle. Okay. Do you know why you like the triangle? Um, no, not really. I was looking at the other ones and they all seemed nice, but I think I just liked the the solid lines that they all have points to them. Um, that's pretty much all I really went with. <laughs> okay, okay. One more person. Hi, everyone. I like this circle. And the reason why I like the circle, it looks like the shape of the of the red blood cells. And I know that the red blood cells carry oxygen and without oxygen, we can't live. Ah. So I so much like that, yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So let me just start with those two. Uh, we had the triangle. Triangle symbolizes love to multitask, being self-motivated, being impatient and being successful. Does that describe your personality? A little bit, yes. <laughs> I do love to multitask. <laughs> I can be doing four things at once and sometimes it annoys people because I'll have three conversations with the same person. I keep jumping <laughs> from things that, and you have to be able to keep up. Okay. <laughs> I mean, four different stories at once. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go to the circle. Circle works best on teams, wants to fix everyone else, reluctant to say no, empathetic and compassionate. Does that describe you? Yes, I think so. <laughs> <You're both laughs> <me> <laughs> okay. And for those who uh, have not uh, had a chance to speak, the square uh, denotes detail-oriented, hates clutter, hesitant to change, and stubborn. And the squiggly line Adapt easy to change, idea generators, easily bored, and loves to try new things. So think about the shapes as we go forward. But I also want us to focus on what do we do with what we find out about what we know? 
and share a little bit of my story. Uh, I grew up in the South and in the United States, you will probably remember that the South was the place that worked the longest to avoid yeah. uh, desegregating. And yeah. I love um, this question because it's a perfect square. So, so, and I like anything that is perfect. And I love doing things perfectly. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And my father, accepted the calling to be a civil rights leader. And he volunteered, if you will, because it wasn't a job that anyone would hire you for. In fact, it was a threat to your life. In those days, um, you could be hanged, or the word we use is lynched by your neck with a rope. Uh, your job could be taken away from you a group of people who wore white hoods and white outfits called the Ku Klux Klan would actually ride through the night. And if they killed a black person, there was no consequence for them. But he stood anyway, um, because he was working on the bus boycott. And that was led by Rosa Parks, a very quiet Christian woman who volunteered to sit on a bus and not get out. She had been trained for that day. She had been trained to one day say no more. And it led to us being able to ride anywhere on a bus and actually being able to work as bus operators. But in that time, my father had to teach us as young children to crawl around our house so that we were not uh, subject to a gunshot. And he tried to have us sleep in the bedroom in the back so that we would not see a cross burned on our lawn a cross burning on our lawn with a signal from the Ku Klux Klan and from white people that you, would, you need to stop what you were doing, a move from where you lived. That was always a source of joy. My mother's job was threatened uh, as a teacher. My father had newspapers subscribed in his name and brought to the house that said he was a communist. And that was a very bad thing then. You could actually be prosecuted for being a communist. But he did not stop. And ultimately, that town uh, desegregated. We know about Montgomery. We don't know about that space in Tallahassee, Florida. And I say that because often the stands we make may not ever be publicized. But we make the stand because we have to make that stand. Fast forward to my high school year. And I was looking forward to going to the wonderful historically Black university in my town called FAMU. And I'm at my high school assembly where they're announcing where we're going. And it is announced I'm going to Florida State University. And I am totally stunned. I've had no conversation. I have a full scholarship to FAMU. And I asked my teacher, how did that get announced? He said, your parents and I made the decision. Well, you didn't ask a question then. You just went along with what your parents said. I asked my parents why. They said, someone needs to go and desegregate Florida State. There were four of us as Blacks in a university with 10,000 white people who did not want us there. But we went. Three of us graduated. I was so sick of them, I graduated. I finished a four-year course in two and two-thirds years because dropping out was not an option. And we were reminded, you're opening the door for people who you may never see and may never know. And what you do here will make a difference in whether this door stays open. I share that because each one of us still, unfortunately, has the opportunity to open a door for someone. We wish the problems had been solved in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. We thought some of the problems were solved, but we're now finding that some doors have to be reopened. Some doors have to be kicked open again. And that is a charge we have. Later in life, as I moved from the South to the West, there were still battles and we still fight those battles. And so the starting of Ward Economic Development Corporation was an effort from a faith base to make a difference in communities where people don't have much money, who 
don't have many jobs, needed to live, and somebody else wanted to push them out. We call it gentrification. And we started trying to protect that. We started trying to be sure that they would still have a place to live. We started trying to be sure that the place they lived was decent and affordable. We are still doing that 35 years later. And it's a baton that I hope to pass on to someone who is younger, the age of my grandchildren, to carry on. Because we know that every generation must be convinced anew, as Coretta Scott King said. And so the best that we do where we are now still has to be rejuvenated by someone in the future. I share with you the importance of volunteerism because it's not always a movement. It's not always the founding of something. It's sometimes sitting on a board and commission. You heard in my introduction, the Baldwin Hills Conservancy. The Baldwin Hills Conservancy is the largest piece of land in the black community that needs to be preserved. Right now, it's a virtual oil field for the most part, where people have found the richness of oil and they're drilling through. We live there, how do we control it? The Conservancy says that as those oil wells are no longer going to be pumping oil, or as they are shut down for whatever reason, they return to being the earth that God had planned for it to be, for us to enjoy. And so it is a job of the members of the board of the Baldwin Hills Conservancy to protect that from the interests who want to keep pumping, who want to start new wells, who want to keep the activity going in our community. And so sitting on that board is not a job. It's a volunteer opportunity. It's an opportunity to go and sit at the table and to say yes and no, and to encourage and to inspire and to find new projects for that area. We now have walking trails. We now have gardens where they used to be all pumpy. And in the future generation, when we pass this baton, we hope it will all end up being returned to enjoyable spaces as God had intended for it. Not wealth creating spaces that take advantage and even pollute the earth. One of the greatest volunteer opportunities is working on the LA Metro board. I've served on many boards and volunteers. Sometimes my husband and my kids wish I would just not talk about what was happening. But I don't know how each one of you might be called to make a difference when there's something happening that affects your church, that affects your neighborhood, that affects your family. We have to be that voice at the microphone. And that's what we were set up to do at Ward Economic Development Corporation. I found myself at the microphone testifying often saying this is a bad policy or encouraging a good policy. And ultimately, I was asked to serve on a number of volunteer boards, hours and hours in the evening, sometimes with success and outcome, sometimes after years, you could not see where you had made movement, but always following God's direction. But LA Metro Board has been different. Finally, I was asked to serve on a board that could bring recycling of dollars to our community. Dr. Van Jimmy talked about spending money with our own. It was an opportunity to create contract opportunities for people who look like me, that they could bid for and receive awards of contracts for millions of dollars to develop transportation in our community, to restore businesses because When we build a train, sometimes we take away business opportunities to support our community, to create jobs, to create career opportunities. Because in transportation, there's 70 or 80 different types of careers that people can have, not just operating the trains and the buses, not just repairing and keeping them in good repair, but in accounting, uh, in, in the legal field, in almost any field, nutrition, almost any field you can think of in transportation. I know the vision on the continent of Africa to have a seamless transportation system. Oh, what a joy it would be, I know, for any of you who are interested in that, to make that difference. More than anything else, when we are at the decision-making table, we can help to control the quality of life that comes to us. 
we can be a part of not just being upset at what an elected official or a point official does that is not good for us. We can be the ones sitting there. And when we are sitting there, we can be the ones ensuring accountability. And when we're not accountable, our brothers and sisters and family members can take us to the woodshed at home to hold us accountable because we're closer, we see each other. When that decision maker is not a part of our community and our lifestyle and our belief system, it doesn't work. And so you're probably aware of the dilemma we have here in the US right now with people who sit in one whole division of federal government, the US Senate, who vote against everything that's in the best interest of black people, who are trying to take away our right to vote. One state where someone is running for office as governor saying, if I get to be governor, I'm gonna purge all of the roles of voters and everybody will have to register again. You know what that's designed to do. That's designed to make sure that few of us vote. And that's not in the South, that's in Pennsylvania. You know, across the country, the issues with the gun. We talked about George Floyd and what happened, how the Black Lives Matter movement was started and how it inspired today, your Black Matters. It is important for us to be in those seats of decision-making. And so as I talk about volunteerism, I can think of no greater calling for us to consider throughout the globe as Blacks, but a special partnership in South Africa and the United States, because 2024 has a special meaning in our moment. What does 2024 mean? 2024 is a time that something's going to happen. And I put here the uh, photo of a 101 year old trailblazer who inspired me. And she said, we must always be mindful that arrogant lies make it difficult for democracy's truth to prevail. And I am a member of the African Methodist Episcopal Church. We have a strong base in uh, throughout the continent of Africa and a strong base in South Africa. We have a toolkit and I list it here that will help us begin to look at 2024, which is an election year. 2024, I don't know if it has a date on the continent of South Africa. I believe you're waiting. Election 2024, when is it on, in South Africa? Is it called by the, uh, the government or do you have a certain date? Here, it's gonna be in November. But should we make voting our highest priority? Yes. We gather to protect the quality of life. We empower ourselves with knowledge to share. We leave to protest anything that will endanger lives and humanity. We stand even if we, we must stand alone. That's what volunteerism ends up being. We volunteer because we believe there's something that has to be done, something that has to be said, and we try to do it. So back to Dr. Jamie Coleman Williams. She said, we must make election, whenever it happens, our highest priority. And there's a way to organize to do that. And most of us will not get paid to do it. Some can be consultants in election, but some and most of us will have to organize. We become team captains and leaders. We make voting the small talk wherever you are, whoever you text, whenever you post and everything you do, let it be. It's our watch. What is this little system that you can take? And I'm going to summarize it here and then come back. It's adapted, and I want to give credit to Sister Lena Kennedy, uh, who's a part of our church. Ten people are captains, and those ten people choose ten leaders. Those ten leaders work under the captain, and the captain stays in contact with the leaders, and they find ten members. Those ten members work under the leader and they find um, nine community people. So it's 10 times 10 times 10 into 1,000. So that one team captain doing his or her job well can impact 1,000. I say to you, my brothers and sisters in South Africa, I am hearing already that the turnout to vote, to turn out to select the leaders who will make the laws of government that impact the quality of life, that will improve what they started out doing in 1976, 
looking for the best schools, ensuring the best education, making sure there are jobs and careers for our people, therefore ensuring that our children and grandchildren will not go hungry, will not lack what they need, simply because someone else has a foot on their neck. That comes with us going to the poll and exercising our right to vote. If I can as one person and just volunteering and doing what I know can be done very simply, staying in contact with those 10 and then 10 and then 10, impact a thousand votes, how different is that than the spirit of 1976 when those members of our African diaspora took to the street to exercise their voices and I am told over 600 were killed. They lost their lives. Maybe some didn't realize that day it would cause their lives, but they were determined to have their voices heard and that's important. So we go back. The 10 captains identify the 10 people and the 10 leaders gathering. They kept, they, they get their information. They stay in touch as we stay in touch about some other stuff that is not of consequence. This is something to stay in touch about. The 10 captains manage that. They check with their team leaders every day or maybe every other day. They keep in communication, encouraging them. They ask them, when you vote, give us your photo. And what do we do with that photo? We create a lasting image of the victory that God has given us. And so I say to you today, because this is my passion, it's the example I'm given. I hope it will become your passion. I hope you will know why you have been called to whatever God has called you to. But in finding a common theme, whether it's South Africa or any other part of our continent, or whether it's in the US where we have been displaced, uh, but still have a role and hopefully have brought the soul of Africa here to actually humanize this nation. We certainly have built it by volunteering. It was called slavery. We didn't do it willingly. We weren't paid for it. We want now to choose how we bring our talents and skills to the table. We want now to be a part of making this nation what it ought to be, what it was called to be, and what we worked hard and put our blood, sweat, and tears to make it be. We want to be nurtured and connected. Today, today I hope you will look at those shapes, find your personality, go to your prayer closet and ask God what God is calling you to do, to be prepared to stand, to be prepared for holy boldness, to be prepared for the victory. Because as God sends us out, we don't need to know where we're going, how we're gonna get there, because God will send all that we need. I don't know about you, but that's been my life. And so I stand with you today. Yes, our Black matters. It is so important that we look not only for that which someone would pay us for, but this becomes the great jumpstart. I thank you for the opportunity to celebrate on this day. And as we go to Juneteenth, the second time it will be a national holiday today. We will rejoice with you in the connection that freedom is always our focus and that what we can do to ensure freedom wherever we are and not just for us, for everyone. That's what happens with us. As we seek freedom for others, the world is free. As we stand, everyone can stand. It is so important to us in this day and on this day to remember the shoulders on which we stand and to be strengthened in our faith walk and our using our talents and skills for God. Because the greatest payment we will get will not be in this world, will be eternal life. I thank you. And if there are any questions, I will certainly leave the tool. Uh, Hopefully you'll go to the website, take the material, change it, just give us a little credit, just say AME. I don't know if I have any AMEs on this phone, uh, on this call today, but find an AME church, 
and tell them they're supposed to be about the mission of freedom. They're supposed to be helping you because no matter where we are, we are called to a mission of liberation. And we are called as individuals of the African diaspora, the first people on the globe. The entire planet should apologize to us, but we're not gonna wait for the apology. We're gonna use our God-given talents and skills to move forward as God is leading us. So yes, our Black Matters, let's jumpstart today with God and together, we cannot fail. Thank you. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you, Sister Jackie. Oh, what an impactful and so much information. Ah, strategies. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for wonderful talk. There, there right. were some questions, if I could. Yes, I will give you the personality interpretation. I will send it to Dr. Fanjimi and um, however she can circulate it. Uh, in fact, I'll send the PowerPoint and you can use the PowerPoint, change the frames, make it your own. Thank you, thank you, Sister Jackie. And I heard that uh, the quest for freedom rests with us. We have no other excuses, as uh, Sister Jackie has uh, emphasized on us tonight, this afternoon. The quest for freedom rests with us. So we cannot wait for nobody to come and help us. And also, I um, was impressed by the shape uh, 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 presentation. And I'd like you to think about these shapes. What shape are you in terms of whenever we have to do some volunteerism, you have to think about what shape you are you so that decision you make will be appropriate. And uh, also we learned that uh, Sister Jackie talked about that uh, we can control the quality of life that comes to us. We can put measures in place that will control the quality of male of life we want. And uh, I know in Africa, we always say is we, the Africa we want, we want to build the Africa we want. And this is what she has already set forth some strategies that we need to do. Thank you, Sister Jackie. And also you mentioned about, we must keep on kicking the doors open. Not every door will be open for us and not every door that we think it's open, it's open, but we must keep doing it. And lastly, you said we shouldn't wait for anybody to make things right, but we must continue. We must not wait for any apology because it might not come, but we must continue to shape our future. Thank you, thank you, thank you uh, uh, for that uh, presentation, inspiring presentation, Sister Jacob. At this time, I'd like also to uh, introduce to you and to express that we have an honor of someone special also uh, in our midst. We have um, uh, the Excellency, the King, uh, uh, Dari Erin of Aluti Erin from Nigeria. We'd like to honor him. And uh, I don't know if ever he would want to uh, say uh, something. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me give uh, over to you, King. Good morning. Are you hearing me? Good morning. Yes, we hear you. Oh. Yes, we hear you. Uh, to be on this program, I'm very happy and elated that I have the opportunity, even though it's the last minute invitation last night, that I could participate on this program. Uh, I really appreciate the two speakers that had already delivered their messages. And uh, I want to say that the dumb start uh, for the youth, the Nigerian perspective, to guide. Uh, the youths of South Africa. Youths are the same all over the world as God is the same. There is no God for black man or God for white man. So what we all believe that is the language of God 
is prayers. And no prayers enter voicemail unless you are in you are in a hurry to get a reply. What I want to say is uh, in the words of uh, Bob Marley, he uh, said, uh, he, he, uh, freedom, uh, you emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves could free our mind. If we listen to the orientation of the whites and do not pursue what is good for the blacks, our youth will always be misled constantly. But we, as kings and traditional rulers, we stand as the pole that is holding the two plates of the scale, balancing what is in the public. Uh, the first speaker, Doctor, uh, made mention of our voracity in devouring things that are foreign. We always buy what we want, not what we need. And that is a road to poverty. Because if you don't buy what you need, and you buy always buy what you want, you end up with a lot of junk in your homes, and there won't be any savings for the future. Uh, whoever wants to live a successful life, not just mere existence, must not depend on welfare support from government alone. The Bible says, whoever puts his hand on the plow must not look back. So if a youth wants to survive, not just exist, you must think of what can I do, not what can I get. If you think, always think of what can I do, you will survive. I give a typical example of two young girls who flew in from Nigeria to the United States uh, for a course of study. One from a, an average group. The other one came in because she passed her exam of scholastic aptitude test, the SAT. And to survive almost became a problem. But she had something going in for her. She knows how to plait hairs and weave and braid hairs. Women yes. So every weekend she's making money, $10, $15 as a stylist, as a hairdresser. And the one that is taking money from home is always writing home for support. The one that was working with her hands always had more than she needed because she knows that to get those money, in her kitty, she needs to put a lot of energy. The one that is getting money from her parents was always spending. So he, they, all, they, they both graduated, but the one that is splitting here has more business sense than the other one. Both of them are now out of college, and one is already working on her own, established a home uh, addressing and uh, people are patronizing her. And if there are events, she will be called upon to come and breed the ass, weave the ass styles, and going across states. So the youths need orientation. What we need most now amongst our youth are two things, discipline and change of values. If you are the one that loves music, you shouldn't make the musician, you, the musician could be your hero, but the musician must not be your, your figure. The, the one you look at, you want to copy. Uh, the lives of late Brenda Fassi or the light of, life of Brace Lucky Lube. Or, if you love music, don't make the musician your role model. Love the music and look away. And that is one of the things that are taking our youth away because of these new electronic things and uh, social media. They will go and start copying whoever is uh, an entertainer and uh, they lose their life, they lose their orientation, they lose their focus. So the youth must have two things now. 
discipline and change of value, respect for elders, respect for customs. Currently, our politicians, they have finished the community. You, are, you say you are either a Christian or a Muslim or a traditional religion. They've added another religion. Some of the people are now made, are forced to worship either the dollar, the naira, or the rand. So if you don't believe seriously that God leads and God provides, and you fall in the trap of the politicians, you will be entrapped and enslaved forever. We should live, we should get our youth orientated to know that to live. It's not by taking bits and pieces from politicians. Uh, we should have a focus, a direction that will make us leaders and not just followers of tomorrow. Uh, I'm not a politician, but as a traditional ruler, we all love all our children who do come. I love the way Julius Malema used to contribute in the parliament. We don't know the local politics of South Africa here, yeah? but when you see him, you know that even where the, the fire is out, there is a coal that still has fire under the ashes and it's coming up. So what the late, the old Desmond Tutu, the, the late Mdiba, uh, 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 well, when, when, when you see what they do, and you now see what Julius Malema usually do in the Congress, we, we believe that there is still hope for the future. Let us all give our youth new orientation. The Lord say, I will not lead you down a road that will hurt you. Trust in me. I will protect you because I love you. If you love God, you will do the right thing. You will not wait for the two muscles. Let us change our orientation as youths. Let us not copy and make uh, entertainers and musicians our role model. They could be people we admire, but let our life be premised on the, on the promises of God and the direction that the Lord has given us, that seek my faith, and I will do all that you require because there is no shortcut to success and there is no shortcut to making it in life except by having the right orientation. The, the last NSAS protest in Nigeria gave us an insight that youths are people to be reckoned with because we never expected that it would escalate to the level that government had to be taking on their knees to listen to them. And that is what happened in South Africa that brought about June 16. Now it is going around the world like wildfire. But to make the youth get what they want, let's give them good examples. Let's not encourage flamboyant uh, preachers who are always talking about riches and prosperity, but those who are preaching salvation and godliness. I pray that this program will lead to a great success. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, His Majesty. Thank you very much. And uh, what a timely, uh, uh, admonishing and advice. Thank you. We appreciate that, that we must have the right orientation. I hope the youth also uh, hears and understands that we must have the right orientation. And also the advice is we must not be a nation that buys uh, what we want. And uh, because that is the route to poverty. And also we the king has also said we must also try to at all times uh, to get what is right. And also two things that are important that can change our life and our course as young people. It is a discipline and a change of values. And uh, we hope that uh, we'll continue to engage 
and uh, also to uh, apply what we just heard today, that we must choose right, uh, the correct or proper right uh, role models. Uh, and he mentioned uh, uh, iconic uh, Brenda Farsi. Uh, she's an iconic in South Africa and many people love and like it Dubin, but we must have the right orientation of our role models. Thank you, uh, uh, our Excellency and uh, uh, His Majesty. And now we are going to go to the next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, none other than Prof. Jacob Gordon. Gordon. He is a uh, emeritus professor, University of Kansas, Kwame Nkrumah Endowed Chair. He's uh, of University of Ghana. Also, he's a senior Fulbright scholar. He attended uh, Bethune Cookman College, graduating with a BA honors in history, and he has masters of arts in history at Harvard, Howard University, and also a PhD history at University of Southern California. All right, here's my, here's, uh, here's my friend, because I just got it from there as well. And uh, he completed a postdoctoral uh, studies with a uh, Kaufman Fellow in uh, Gentology. And at the University of Kansas, he was founding chair of the Department of African and African American Studies in 1970. He was the first black professor awarded to the distinction of Professor Emeritus from the University of Kansas. For more than 50 years in higher education, he has been devoted to research, teaching, and service in African studies and the black experience in diaspora. He is an author or co-author of 30 books, uh, <laughs> the latest of which is the selected works of an African scholar in diaspora, a retrospective analysis that was uh, published in 2020 and African American studies. Dr. Gardin is the recipient of many awards. Most recently, the International Education Partnership Award from uh, KU and the Outstanding Alumni Award uh, from Bethune Cooksman University, both in, in, 2020, in 2019. He has traveled throughout Africa, the Caribbean, Europe, South and North America. He serves as a historian of the BCU National Africa, International Bullying Prevention Association Board of Directors, and also advisory board of the African American Studies Program at the University of Florida. Also, he external doctoral uh, examiner for the University of Cape Town, South Africa. He is the president of the Alutra uh, County, Africa and African American Historical Society, Inc. He is the chair of the Alutra County African American History Task Force and the president of the United Nations Association Gainesville Chapter. Dr. Uh, Prof. Gordon will speak to us on the impact of bullying and how we can overcome it. Welcome, Professor. Thank you for your wonderful introduction. Uh, with the permission of the elders in the house, I would like your indulgence to observe for a moment those who fought very hard to improve the quality of education and quality of life in South Africa in 1976. Many of them died, so let's honor them in a moment of silence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your introduction. I bring you greetings from the Sunshine State of Florida on this great occasion. I've listened very carefully to all the presenters. What a wonderful day. I'm so excited about Dr. Francisca's presentation, Ms. Walker and, and the King, this is really wonderful. I learned quite a lot and thank you so much. I have a few moments to make some remarks. People who fought 1976, they were demanding quality education. I want to make sure as we celebrate this 46th anniversary 
of the Soweto uprising, that we keep that in mind. But based upon the data that I'm looking at, first, when I was working on this book, it's called Bullying, Prevention, and Intervention at School. I met the professor, Michael uh, Koibi, at University of Cape Town, where a lot of doctoral students are studying the impact of bullying. So most of the data I have comes from there. In addition to that, UNESCO, the United Nations uh, Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization has also done a lot of studies in a global context. And they have found that out of one out of every three students is bullied every day throughout the world. One out of three. So that bullying is not limited to South Africa, it is worldwide. First, what is bullying? Bullying may be defined as the misuse of power in relationships through repeated verbal, physical, and mental behaviors that are intended to harm people. That's a working definition behavior that are intended to harm people. And this behavior can take place in two places. One in person, in-person behavior. The other is what we call cyber, cyber bullying, technology, which a lot of the speakers have alluded to, the media. And cyber bullying is a major problem in South Africa. Everybody seems to have a cell phone, Nigeria and the rest of them. And so they are using cyberbullying to actually abuse people. But we have to understand what are some of the major causes of bullying. Why do young people take that route? Well, some of them is because they lack attention at home to begin with. Remember, charity begins at home, That's no me. attention. Some of them were abused by their siblings. Some of them simply don't understand when they engage with other people, the diversity in the African context or in the global context. What tribe do you belong to? How do you look like? How tall are you? How short are you? How far are you? What is your sexual orientation? All that misunderstanding, they go into play when young people begin to bully because they just don't like what they say. Other just copy, people have got away with bullying and they appear to be making progress. So there's a lot of mimicry in there. And so young people become involved in bullying because they want to exercise power. Now, bullying alone is not, is the main, the, 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 the impact of bullying is very critical. People are literally dying. Young people are committing suicide because they've been bullied. Those who are victims of bullying are ashamed to even talk about it. And so they just take their life. Some are having mental illness. Some are sexually abused every day. And that is a very big problem in South Africa. And so what they fought for in 1976, they are self-destructing it. It's impacting education. Kids are dropping out of school. You drop out of school, what quality of life do you think you are going to have? There are no jobs, you become thief, and you kill people just to have money or even to have food to eat. In addition to that, bullying is adding to the cost of education. Schools are forced to have to employ additional staff who have counseling experience, who are law enforcement officers. In fact, they are training some as we speak in South Africa. I just been reading a doctoral dissertation on a young lady who has written about the impact of bullying on women who are in universities. These are not little kids anymore, but it had a great impact in the universities. And so bullying is a major problem. It's causing violence in schools and violence in school. Schools are not meant for violence. 
it disrupts education. And when you have no education, what do you have in the modern world? Almost nothing. So there are a lot of behaviors in bullying. People use cyberbullying to tease their friends or their enemies. They have false information on the, on the media and the victims are ashamed because they have false information. They just lie on them. They, 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 they compel them to certain behaviors, maybe sexual behavior, by you are threatening them. If you don't do this, this is what's gonna to happen to you. If you don't join my club, we are gonna kill you. If you are not a part of my village or my tribe, this is gonna be your problem. So cyberbullying, it has become a very, very big problem uh, uh, in, in South Africa. Now, some of you are probably 10 years old or 12 or 15 or 19. You may ask, I'm a young person, what can I do? So here, I'm gonna conclude a call for action. Cyberbullying cannot be solved alone by adults. You young people can solve the problem, be a part of it. The first thing you wanna do is, one is what can you do about yourself? The first step is don't be a part of the problem. That's one solution. Do not be a part of the problem. If you want to solve cyberbullying, be a part of the solution. Number two, know who you are. Dr. Fajemi talked about history, black history, right from biblical time to the present time. How much do you know about your history? One of the things that I was really very disappointed about, as Kwame Krumah, distinguished chair, I spent three years in the continent, traveling everywhere, including South Africa. Went to Nesme Dendi's village to document African leadership and governance. That was my, my, my research. I was in Morocco, you name it, I was there, Nigeria, all of them, Botswana, East Africa. I went back to Ethiopia where I studied my higher education at the University of Addis Ababa in the late 1950s. I was very concerned about the absence of teaching African history. When I was in school in Nigeria, I knew everything about British Empire history, but not one sentence about Nigerian history. That, that trend continues a very large measure up to today. There are few universities in the continent where you have institutes or centers or departments of African studies. There are few that actually have archives. So when I say, know your history, what am I saying? You were gonna ask me, where do I find it? Well, you the same media. You can Google anywhere and get the information. The African studies in China. I have scholars who are working with me in China about the African presence in China. African presence in India. A book is called African Elite in India. Africa is everywhere. I was in Brazil. Africa is everywhere. So you can also talk with the elders in your community to learn oral history. Oral history has become history now. When I was growing up, oral history was not history. The Europeans told us it had to be written in the past record. There's so much you can learn from your parents at home, at dinner table. Some history to build up your self esteem because without that, it's very difficult. You're going to engage in bullying, the lack of self esteem, confidence in yourself. The king talked about discipline and values. What values do you have? What are your spiritual values that are going to help you to go through difficult times? So young people can do a lot. You can even become engaged in politics in the process, writing letters to your lawmakers, policymakers, call the attention to the impact of bullying so that it can create some laws Zero tolerance bullying in every school in South Africa We go a long way. If you violate the law, you are punished. But only politicians can pass the law. 
but the young people can help politicians to become aware of the problem. You can write letters, you can call them, you can help people to create some town hall meetings to talk about solutions. You can engage young people who are like you, who are not a part of the bullying group to advance the cause of zero tolerance of bullying because it's bad for your health. As a young person, develop healthy relationships with your age group, with your role models, find role models in your text. Not those who are making quick money and going to prison. If you know your history, we know role models. Study about Masa Musa, for example. Study about the early people who gained independence for Africa. Nelson Mandela, Namdi Azikiwe, Kwame Nkrumah, Jomo Kayanta. We have a lot of heroes. You don't have to go to 200 years to find out something about yourself. So young people, you can do a lot to mobilize your youth and help to mobilize the adults, the teachers in schools, the law enforcement people to really make sure that what people died for in 1976, they did not die in vain. They wanted quality education because education, good education is the most important variable for upward mobility in the global community. And so I urge you to get engaged in anti-bullying movement within your co-hosts and with, with the adult community. Make sure those of you in boarding house, when you come home, have some discussion with your parents. Say, mama, daddy, this is what happened today. If you see something, you hear something, do something. And doing something doesn't mean you're going to be silent. Communicate to other people. Anytime you see something that is bad, do something about it. No one can save us except us. And with that, I want to thank you for the opportunity to make a few remarks. And I'll be very glad to take any questions. Thank you, Prof. <laughs> There's so much that we have learned from whatever we have, we have been trying, you know, we have heard from the speakers. And uh, it's so mind blowing. Uh, so you need we need to to sit back and just bring things you know in and digest what we have already um, uh, uh, heard today. And I would like definitely to uh, thank our speakers for their time and uh, for their wonderful and inspiring. Um, messages for, for our youth day. This is a special day. And also they are to be given a charge to go back and to um, uh, mobilize, to volunteer and to change our course. And I, 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 I hope we are going to put those in, uh, in action in every sphere of our, in our spaces, wherever we are. I would like to thank our panel and to thank our speakers, presenters, our speakers for their timely message on this day. This is a special time, especially I never had a, an event where a king attended. So we had a special time and with the king as well. It's so special. I don't know if ever you don't know, but it's so special to have all of you um, with us tonight and this afternoon. I really thank you for that. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful one. And uh, please continue to uh, support one another, encourage one another, and remain blessed. We'll be back next year with power, with might, and a lot of strength. Okay, thank you. Have a good one, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.